it was just so much to know, so much to learn, and uh, a lot to take in. But um, you know, I just I I stayed patient. I learned. I listened. I wrote things down, and um, you know, training training went well at the beginning. But it was definitely physically and mentally grueling. Is it safe to say when you took your first few bumps, it actually hurt? But when after you took your next few bumps, like maybe I don't know a month later, did you start to feel less pain? Sure, yeah, definitely. You know, your body is your body's getting used to everything from hitting the ropes to you know back bumping, uh, taking a, a front bump, um, falling outside the ring, hitting the turnbuckle. You're using your body in ways that your body's never uh, worked before. So. Um, for weeks, I was sore. My body was calloused up. Just you know, I still have a little fatty tumor on my on my lower back from hitting the ropes. That'll probably never go away. You know, um, and even today when I take bumps, sometimes they still hurt. But definitely, your body gets used to it. You 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 get proficient at at doing it, doing it well, and and being safe. And over time, it definitely gets better. But uh, definitely, at first, you get a little uh, get sore, and it's discouraging because you're in a lot of pain. Um, you see, before you started training, um, we were talking about a bit earlier um, in our interview that we um, maybe you were a little too small. Um, did you have any doubters before um, you started training, and how did you deal with the doubters? Uh, sure. You know, even my own family doubted me. Uh, when when you say I want to be a professional wrestler, they, the first thing they think about is, especially um, the older generation of people, they think of guys like Hulk Hogan and, and the Ultimate Warrior and, and Randy Savage and and guys who were really, really big. But the wrestling business has changed and it's evolved where a lot of smaller guys, my size even smaller, are making a living at this now. So um, back then, the smaller frame guys weren't so much in the spotlight as they are now, but um, there were there were doubters. And um, even after I had started doing matches and I started uh, you know doing extra work for WWE, people were still saying I was too small. And you know, for me to say, oh, well, you know you, you know what, you're right, I'm going to quit now was, was never an option. I just kept going, kept trying to put muscle on, try to look as good as I can uh, when I did get in front of the camera. And I don't know, I, I guess I just kind of used that, uh, used those words and the negative attitude as motivation to, to just get better. Ladies and gentlemen, you guys are listening to the interview of R.J. Brewer. This is Jordan Garver uh, interviewing R.J. Brewer. If you guys want, you can uh, follow me on uh, Twitter at JordanZone17, Instagram at JordanZone17, on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash JGarber1, um, and you can check out my main website, WrestlingWorld247.com. And um, RJ, is there any plugs you want to take out there too early for the fans that are listening? Um, I actually uh, have Twitter now. I haven't had it for too long, maybe about six months, and it's at RJ Brewer 1070 which is 1070 and my Facebook page is facebook.com backslash rjbrewer1070. And I also have a website, rjbrewerusa.com, and a YouTube channel. So um, I'm trying to cover all aspects of social media now because as much as I don't love it, I realize it's important to try to reach as many people as you can. So you've also been trained by Mike Hollow. Um, um, describe the experience of training with Mike Hollow. Well, you know, Mike Hall, Mike Hall is a guy that a lot of people don't know who he is, and, and they've a lot of people have never heard of him. When I uh, signed up for Kowalski School, he was the he was the head trainer at the time. Obviously, Killer Kowalski's name was on the building, and um, he's the guy that drew people into the uh, to the training center because people wanted to be trained by a legend. And Kowalski is the guy who trained Perry Saturn, Triple H, China, Big John Studd. A lot of guys went through there, so his name drew the people in. But Hollow was really the guy who ran the drills and and um, was in charge of getting guys ready for shows and getting them in condition. And he was phenomenal as a trainer. I mean, a lot of guys, again, don't know who he is, but he got me in the best shape of my life. Um, he did a lot of military-style drills, and his main focus was to be safe and to protect yourself, protect your opponent. And, you know, that kind of mentality um, showed whenever Kowalski guys would go do indie shows, they were always the most polished guys in the area because uh, he really trained guys to... Uh, take pride in their work, learn the basics, um, focus on the little things, not so much the big things, and uh, conditioning was, was the biggest plus. And I remember doing 30-minute matches in, uh, a year into my career and not getting tired, and it was definitely because of the drills he put us through. Also, I uh, also forgot another shout-out for the uh, main uh, website that this is on. Uh, everyone that is listening right now um, from around the world, and maybe R.J. Brewer's fans in particular, uh, you can check out hellinaformradio.com backslash, uh, sorry, 
blogtalkradio.com backslash Um, you That's where you can get this uh, show's episodes. you got Pop Culture Madness, some NBA season predictions. Mo- fe- uh, Voice of Garber featuring myself. There's an interview with r- the late, great Roland Alexander and Bruce Hart and um, Kid Cash, former Cruiserweight champion. So um, um, check that out, fan. Also, R.J. Brewer is on the air, as we obviously know. He's talking to us about his wrestling career. He's also asking questions. So, sorry, answering questions. Um, so, any fans can call in at 626-414-3569. Um, I'm just going to announce quickly that unless the wrestler calling in is using Skype, which I think he is, is the fans cannot use Skype um, because I do not want a bunch of controversy on the shows. Because I want to get, this is about wrestling. I don't want to just deal with stupid questions. I want to, if you want to ask a question, message me on my Facebook or call in using a number that you can be tracked by. All right, so um, RJ, you t- let's just get to the big stuff early. Um, i just ask a random question right there. You had a WrestleMania appearance not as a wrestler, but as one of Undertaker, Taker's Druids. Tell us the experience right. of just being a Druid at the biggest stage of them all. Like, you, you're at WrestleMania. That's the best in wrestling there is. Describe your experience doing that and just looking the atmosphere during the Undertaker's entrance. That must be terrific. It, yeah, you know, the, the cool thing about that is that it was at Madison Square Garden, which is, you know, one of the original meccas for for uh, you know, pro wrestling and, and WrestleMania in in particular, so it was really cool. I had done a bunch of WWE extra work before that, but it was just a, a feeling in the air that you can't really describe uh, for WrestleMania. You know, there were different celebrities there. There were WWE Hall of Famers there being inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame, and it was just a totally different atmosphere. You just back there in Madison Square Garden, you got thousands of people watching, millions across the world, and you just get this vibe that something special is happening and. You know, uh, I had, like I said, that was my, I think, third or fourth show that week. I had wrestled a couple independent shows Friday, Saturday, and then I did WrestleMania Sunday, then I did Raw and SmackDown Monday and Tuesday. So this was at the period of time where I was doing a lot of extra work for WWE, and it was cool, you know, just uh, you're live, it's WrestleMania, you got this, you got this job to do, and of course, you know, extra work is not the most glamorous stuff in the world, but, you know, they need people for it, and you go out there and do it, and yeah, we were all druids, and um, we were carrying these really, really heavy torches that were on fire, and it was nerve-wracking because he's walking right under him, and you feel like you, you might drop this on his head because that's how heavy they were. And I remember my arms were trembling, and it's, you know, one of those things that's live. You have one take, and, you know, um, is that the kind of thing I want to do at a WrestleMania? No, not really, but at the same time, whatever they're hiring you for, you go do it. And it was fun. It was a fun atmosphere, and... Um, you know, I had a lot of moments like that, but it was definitely a lot different when it was a WrestleMania. You definitely. Um, so, was the were the other wrestlers uh, were there druids other wrestlers or was that just extras? Because like, I when when you see the backstage scenes, when you see the camera guys, and you see most of them, pe- those people backstage you see on a Raw show are pretty much independent wrestlers or wrestlers they call up that are locals. Were the other druids sure. independent wrestlers or were they just, were, were they just actors? Yeah, they were all they were all pretty much wrestlers, uh, independent wrestlers from the area, from the Northeast, and I think more often than not, I don't know how it is now. I haven't been there in a long time, but I'm pretty sure it's, you know, they have they have their set guys that they call in certain states when they need extra extras, whether it be for skits or for security or for matches or whatever it might be. So, yeah, I don't, I've never been backstage in the th- in you know the three years I was doing extra work for them, I never saw anybody that was non wrestler doing doing extra stuff. Well, that's actually a good thing to see because, you know, it, it's, it's actually really cool because um, it brings me back to a moment when um, Wrestling World 247 interviewee Justin Maine and Wrestling World 247 interviewee, who, who you obviously probably came across uh, came across with in uh, MCW in, um, new, in the New England region, Brian Fur- Fury, mm-hmm. um, they both had those roles in WWE, and it's just probably a... You know, when you see the security guards and you're a fan watching on TV, you say, wow, oh, my God, I, I actually seen these people wrestle on an independent show, maybe in my area, maybe not. But that's what the cool thing is, is when you see, like, maybe jobbers in the ring, most of them, if you follow wrestling, you would have heard of. Right. So yeah, that, that's and the it cool gives, thing. It, it almost gives those guys, you know, and, and it's a step closer to, to getting a tryout or getting a look because – 
when they bring guys down there for security, they might see a guy, they say, hey, that goes, guy would look good for this particular role. You know, wrestling is all about timing, not always talent, but timing. Um, so you might be in the right place at the right time doing extra work that might land you a job. So um, any opportunity is good. Got two questions here from a fan. Um, he wanted me to give him a shout out to Mike Hunt, whoever that is, and um, he asked a more of a you know naive question, but a question in particular. Uh, have you ever met Kane? He said. I have met Kane. Yeah, I actually, um, you know, I, I was like I said, I've done a lot of extra work, and he was there a bunch of times, and. I'm really uh, I'm really good friends with Stevie Richards, and he's one of my better friends in the wrestling business, and him and Kane are really close friends. So um, Kane was always pretty friendly, but was a lot more outgoing once he found out I was friends with Stevie. So, um, yeah, I, I've met him a couple times, and he seems like a good guy and very political, too, and he's you know seems to uh, have a lot of the same views as I do. So it's, it's pretty refreshing to see another wrestler with uh, the same kind of ideals that I have. All right, so uh, Mike Hunt was a wrestler, was a wrestler. Um, and anyways, just a uh, shout out to him. Uh, you met Kane or Mike H. Um, let's see now. You um, you talk about your experiences before getting to the WWE. Do you, when you were wrestling in the independents, did you have that goal set that you were going to actually make it to even wrestle one WWE match? Well, yeah, I think everybody who gets into professional wrestling does it because they because they want to get into WWE. I think, um, you know, when I was a kid, WCW and WWE were the two big the two big companies, and um, WWE was the one. You know, WCW had folded by the time I started my training, or maybe a little bit after. I don't remember exactly what year that was, but um, and ECW was on its way out. So when I first started training and I started working shows, WWE was the only place to work really to make a living and. Even if they weren't, um, that's the place. I mean, that's the ultimate goal of every wrestler when they first get into the business. Their goals might change once they start training. They might say, oh, I want to go to Japan or I want to go to England or I want to go to TNA or uh, Mexico, whatever it might be. You know, people's goals change and people's outlooks on wrestling change once they start training. But when you first start, yeah, WWE is where you want to go. Otherwise, what are you getting into it for? So, um, yeah, you know, that was my goal. I, I wanted to be a pro wrestler. And, you know, as the years went by, WWE was still kind of on the back of my mind, but I also said, you know, I'm content just making a living at this. So that was my ultimate goal, and a lot of times it's not very easy to do. But you know, you just you just do your best and hope that opportunities come up. And I've always told myself that if I left wrestling tomorrow, I would be happy with what I accomplished. I might not have made millions, but um, there's you know there's other parts of life that are important to me too. So wrestling isn't the only uh, the only thing for me, but. You know, yeah, overall, you, you do it because you want to be as good as you can at it. What is the worst injury you have ever suffered, and did that injury think um, make you think about not returning to the ring ever again? Well, I've been very, very fortunate. I've been pretty injury-free my whole career. You know, everybody gets banged up. Um, you know, you twist an ankle, you 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 get a, um, you know, you get a sore neck, sore back from a certain bump, and um, you might spray, you know, pull up, pull up. Uh, I don't know, pull a muscle somewhere, but I've been very fortunate. I'm 34 years old now, and I've I've wrestled with a lot of guys who are, you know, 10 years, 8 years younger than me who have already had surgeries and, and you know, dislocated shoulders and, and that kind of stuff. I've been very, you know, very careful um, at the bumps I take. I don't wrestle shows in front of 10 people because, uh, you know, just to say I'm a wrestler, I, I made sure that all my appearances meant something, and I was – you know, like I was telling you earlier, Mike Hollow my, my training us, he, he made us um, always protect ourselves, and that's what I always did when I was in the ring. So I've been very fortunate, haven't had a lot of injuries, and, and I've also never put a steroid in my body, and a lot of these injuries in wrestling I think are due to that because, you know, guys are putting crazy amounts of muscle onto joints that aren't meant to hold that much, and their bones get brittle, and that's how they break stuff. So um, I've steered clear of all that stuff, and, you know, overall it's been good. I really take care of my body, and... I've been fortunate to not have any major injuries. In front of a ring, and you see a bunch of fans cheering and cheering and everything, or maybe booing you if you're a heel. What do you What do you think about that? Do you ever feel? Do you ever have a day when you just froze up and you just said, "Oh my, oh my God, I can't." Maybe particularly WrestleMania, or maybe just the show at Lucha Libre USA, or your Ring of Honor debut, or a WWE debut. Have you ever had a moment when you just stood there in fear and you just didn't want to work that show? 
didn't want to work it? Yeah. Has you ever just been so nervous before that you just didn't want to do it? Oh, no. I mean, you know, as as nervous as I've gotten uh, over the years, not not so much now. I, I don't remember the last time I was nervous for a match. But when I first started, yeah, then, you know, there was always nerves when you first walk out. Uh, even right before you walk out is probably where the nerves are the most. But once you walk out there, you remember what you were, you, you remember why you're there. You're there to put on a show uh, for the fans, and and you remember all the training you did. So for me, there's really no um, there's no place there's no place for nerves once you're out there. You got to go out there, be a professional, and do your job, and um, that's what I've always done. But sure, you get nervous before matches all the time, and um, you see big crowds that are there to you know cheer you or boo you. Hey, that's part of the job. Uh, I, I want to hear reactions, so that stuff would motivate me more than anything. Not definitely not to, uh, um, definitely not to say, "Hey, I can't do this," but more, "Hey, I got to go do this better." Let's see. Here, I'm actually on um, CageMatch.net. I don't know if you heard the site before, but um, I'm, there and, um, I'm looking at your matches, and you, um, you wrestled a long time. You wrestled in Ring of Honor. You were a mainstay. You wrestled at Crown. According to Cage Match, I can't believe this is a great wrestling resource. Fans, if you're an interviewer and you want to interview a wrestler, check out the site. I'm just extending my advice to you guys. You wrestled 23 matches in 2004, probably more. They probably missed one. What was it like being a mainstay in the top independent promotion in those years? Um, yeah, 2003 and 2004 were definitely probably my, my busiest years. That's when I was working for Ring of Honor and ECWA and Chaotic Wrestling and I, I was probably wrestling, you know, five or six times a month at the time and um, traveling a lot down the East Coast. So, yeah, it was it was cool, you know. Um, once you hit a certain age, though, you realize you only have so many bumps in your body. So to have that kind of schedule now, unless I was getting paid a lot of money and it was my, um, you know what I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to, to do that so much now, uh, independent stuff. You know, if I was on, you know, wrestling three or four nights a week and that was my full-time job and I was traveling around, I could do it. You know, I'm still in, in as good a shape as I was when I was 20, but um, you got to pick and choose your spots wisely, and you can't go out there um, and wrestle every single independent show like, like you're just starting. When you're just starting, you want to get as much exposure and experience as you can, but uh, once you've established who you are and promoters start contacting you, I think going out and wrestling every single weekend is, is not the best idea because, you know, you get a chance of injury and, Again, your appearances don't mean so much if, if people can say, oh, hey, I'm going to see R.J. Brewer this weekend. I just saw him last weekend. To me, I, I think it's more special when uh, you're more of an attraction and, and, and a once-in-a-while kind of thing. So, uh, you know, 2003, 2004 was cool, but uh, you know, I've gotten a little older and learned a lot more about myself and about the wrestling business. So a uh, schedule like that is not what I have now. Um, how did you get your, um, what did WWE say? How did you get into WWE? Did they call you? Did they contact you? How did you get in WWE, and how did they like you enough to get give you a few matches? Well, at the time, I was, you know, Chaotic Wrestling was, uh, you know, the promotion up in New England that had ties with WWE, and Dr. Tom Pritchard, who's the, uh, you know, talent guy at the time, was doing camps at Chaotic, and, you know, he came, and he liked me and liked a couple of the other guys, so we were just basically booked locally whenever uh, WWE was on the East Coast, uh, whether it be you know Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Delaware. I even went down to Washington, D.C. That's how far I went down uh, on the East Coast. Uh, they pretty much called us, and there was a time when I was working for them three times, four times a month, and you know, the, I, I, at, I was being told by different people that a contract was coming, but it never did. And, uh, you know, for various reasons maybe, but uh, I still value my time there. I learned a lot, and I, I definitely appreciated the uh, opportunity that I had to work with them, but it just never panned out for, as a full-time job for me. Um, I'm sorry to my, to my fans. But... Um, I can hear Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. Towards the tail end of the question, I can hear you, but a lot of the uh, beginning stuff is kind of a little fuzzy. Oh, man, this phone is terrible, but, yeah, I should have used it. We have, like, four phones in our house. I should have just got, like, a better phone. But um, if I am breaking up fans, and if you don't like me breaking up, I can always, um, I can always, uh, we can always talk to RJ again. Hopefully he can do it again. But in the meantime, uh, we are still doing this interview with RJ Brewer. Um, so, anyways, you know, you team, with, going on with the WWE, um, you teamed with uh, Daniel Bryan. How does it feel to team up with somebody 
actually, before we ask that question, let's talk about your experience in Lucha Libre USA and your experience on winning the championship. Well, Lucha Libre USA, uh, I've wrestled for them for the past three and a half years, and that's pretty much been my, you know, my my full time job uh, in wrestling. I, you know, we'll still do some independent stuff here and there, but that's pretty much my, um, you know, my contracted company now. And um, it was cool, you know, they they were trying something different, bringing Mexican wrestling to the United States. And um, you know, we had two seasons on MTV Two, and then a season on Hulu, which um, you know, the MTV season uh, came up a little short, and it didn't last the whole season, but um, it was good because I got to play, you know, a, a political character and, and basically just was able to uh, be myself um, on TV and um, got a lot of mainstream publicity out of it and, you know, wrestling the, a lot of the Lucha guys and I was the uh, guy that stood for, you know, for stronger immigration and um, it definitely got me a lot of hate mail and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of mainstream press and I was all over um, CNN, Fox News and Nightline and some other big newspapers and radio stations, so the press I got from it was good and um the reaction to my you know my my wrestling character was was something like you know that a lot of people in wrestling hadn't seen before so it kind of made my job a lot easier when I came out there with the Arizona flag talking about you know um lucha libre not belonging in the United States and Mexican wrestling you know not coming here and trying to send everybody home it, it got really uh, personal for a lot of the fans um do you have uh, what was I going to say do you have an experience um, in wrestling that you kind of was your greatest moment in wrestling? Like, what was your greatest moment you've ever accomplished in your career? You should say. Oh, I, I wish I could say that I had one. I, I don't know if I, if I even had one yet. I, I, uh, you know, there's been a lot of great moments. I remember my senior year in college. Um, about a year after I started training, we did a, a benefit show at my school for a friend of mine who had cystic fibrosis and uh, we raised a lot of money with a fundraiser and there was about four or 500 uh, students from my school and, you know, a lot of friends that were there and it was real nerve wracking because it was probably only my third or fourth singles match. But at the same time, we raised a lot of money for a good cause and to see everybody come out and, um, you know, support it was, was pretty cool. So that was definitely a moment that I'll always remember. And, you know, my first match is something I'll always remember. My first time going to wrestle for WWE, um, you know, going out for these Lucha Libre shows in front of 5,000 people and getting stuff thrown at me and, and getting heat like that that I never knew existed was cool. So there, there's so many different moments, but I can't really pinpoint one of them. All right. I've got a question from the director of actually the show. Um, who is um, the director of JML at Lo Russo? Who is your favorite wrestler growing up, and who would you love to face in a match, anyone from the past or present? Favorite wrestler growing up, well, when I first started watching, you know, I was, like I said, I was a WWE fan, so obviously, you know, I was a Hulkamaniac, like the Ultimate Warrior, Randy Savage, but from that time from that time frame, Jake the Snake Roberts was, was probably my favorite wrestler. Um, it was just something about his promo, something about the way he carried himself, um, his eye contact when he talked to the camera, and, you know, obviously it was cool that he carried a snake around too, so I would say he was probably my favorite from that era. But then once I started training and working shows, um, I, I, more, I fell in love more with, like, the, um, you know, the real workhorses. Like, you know, I was a big Benoit fan, uh, Eddie Guerrero, Shawn Michaels, uh, Owen Hart, Kurt Angle, those kind of guys because I started to appreciate the work more so than the character. Um, but I always tell people all the time, if there's one guy I could have wrestled, it was definitely Eddie Guerrero. I thought inside the ring, his, you know, his character, his uh, just the way he was was, was awesome. So, um I would say Eddie Guerrero, but there's you know there's a lot of other guys. But if I had to pick one, he'd be the guy that I wish I could have wrestled at some point. How does it feel um, getting notice from posting trades, the most popular zine and all that? But how does it feel to be called the 144th best wrestler in the world? Like that's pretty high. That's pretty good. Cause there's yeah, I, I didn't even wrestling. realize though. I didn't even realize I was that high. Um, I actually think the last time I was in the PWI 500 was probably like three or four years ago. I don't think I've been in it for the past couple of years. But, you know, it's it's always cool. I mean, you know, some people might look into that a little too much, and other people might say, oh, you know, it doesn't mean anything. But anytime you're recognized by any any press, whether it be a wrestling magazine or a newspaper or, you know, TV, anytime somebody acknowledges you, it's good. Any press is good press. So um, I take that as the same uh, with the same 
same attitude that anytime you're in a publication and somebody's picking up something that's on newsstands and seeing your name, it might force them to look into you a little more. Um, you know, how they determine those rankings, I'm not sure, but um, hey, I'll, you know, I'll, like I said, I'll take any publicity that I get, and uh, uh, it's cool. You know. Let's see here. Um, um, who is your wrestler? Who is your mentor throughout your career? And do you think you've impressed them, you've impressed them with your career so far? Okay, I, I lost you a little bit on that question. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, who is your wrestling mentor, and um, do you think you've made him proud? Um. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, Killer Kowalski was the guy who obviously, um, you know, was was the you know was the the guy who owned the school where I trained in here, the WWE Hall of Famer. And um, unfortunately, when I first started training, he was kind of on his way out. He was still there. He would show us things on the weekends, but he wasn't really um, involved in the training as I thought when I first started. So, um, you know, he he would always compliment me on my matches, and he was always appreciative of of uh you know the work I did so I would say I I hope I made him proud and then you know Mike Hollow was the head trainer um and you know a lot of the stuff he taught me I still carry with me today so um I don't know if I have one particular mentor I have a lot of people who have helped me and a lot of people who have influenced me and um you know in the end you're the, you're really your own man and you got to um you got to um I'm trying to see how to say this you, your name means everything in wrestling you know people will always forgive you for a bad match but people will not always forgive you if you're a jerk and you have a bad reputation. So um, your name is really all you have, and your reputation is, is so important that, um, you know, it's cool to try to impress and make your mentors proud. But in the end, you really got to do this for yourself and make sure that you uh, get as much out of it as you put in. We're going to be taking in, um, I have one more question after this caller. Actually, maybe a few more questions if another caller comes in, but we've got a caller coming in from Area Code 204. That is Manitoba. You are on the air. CJ, what's going on? I'm really enjoying this interview. RJ, I uh, have nothing but admiration for you, and I absolutely love the Nightline piece that you did and uh, all the stuff with the immigration policies and everything. It's I, I love it. It's it's amazing. Well, it's just some of the I best lo- promos. I love that you have a better. I love that you have a better phone than the host. Let's start with that. Yes, well, thank oh, you. my God. I, I Come know. on. That's, that's, an, that's a risk. Come on. No. My phone is, your phone is um, choppy, too. Pay Mr. your phone Craig. bill, Juicy J. Pay your phone bill. Unbelievable. But I've got a question. It's unreal. I've, uh, um, I've got a question for you, RJ. Um, sure. You were talking about Jake the Snake, and uh, I love Jake the Snake. You were right, about, right on about his promos. He grew up watching all that era, and he was one of my favorites. But I just want to know your opinion, whether you may not even be up to speed, um or even care, but what do you think of the current WWF, WWE product today? Because I was, I, Juicy J and I talk once in a while, and I tell them how much I despise it, and I don't know why I even watch it anymore. It's because it's become so unwatchable. And after watching sure. some of your promos on YouTube and, 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 and some of your stuff, I mean, I, I just could, this is, I don't know how to put this, but I don't know how you would even fit in with the product because you're just, you're t- too good. I mean, they would destroy you as far as I'm concerned. They would, it would be horrible i see what they do to some of these guys and i just you know i I don't know if that makes sense or not but i mean you're you're so far above it and it it would just i don't know does that make any sense whatsoever but yeah i mean i appreciate that but yeah i mean i I understand what you're saying because they do have a a tendency to take certain guys who i i think they could make a lot of money with and and they don't do the right thing Uh, the reason for it i don't know a lot of times to them you know how you look cosmetically is the only thing that matters and Sometimes if you don't have the body they're looking for, they're not interested. And other times you might piss somebody off. You might have pissed somebody off eight years ago, and they still hold the grudge. There's a lot of babies in pro wrestling. There's a lot of there's a lot, it's funny because you got these guys who are 260 pounds of muscle, but they're sensitive like little girls. You know what I mean? And sometimes you hurt people's feelings, and and they never forget it. Oh, that guy didn't shake my hand eight years ago. You know what I mean? So uh, the reason a lot of people don't get their breaks uh, can be the most minuscule, minute thing in the world, and it's really sad and. Um, I don't know. I, I don't watch the product now. I haven't watched any wrestling on TV, to be honest with you, in years. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't really have a reason. I just, every time I turn it on, I don't like what I see, so I don't really watch it. But um, as for me going there, yeah, I mean, you know, the reason my, my uh, you know, R.J. Brewer has been so effective is because I, I wrestle in front of uh, Latino fans and, 
against Latino wrestlers and the immigration thing means a lot to those people. Um, you saw when WWE tried to do the same thing, it just didn't work so much because the uh, the audience isn't there. I tell all my friends all the time, 12-year-old John Cena fans don't care about immigration. You know what I mean? They, 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 it doesn't mean exactly. anything to them. But but to my, the fans I'm wrestling in front of, a lot of them came from immigrants. So to them, it's it's a lot more personal and um, yeah, I, I don't think if I went there it would work the way it's working now. But, um, you know, you, you take every opportunity you get. And um, I don't know. I, I don't really know what they would do with me. But um, they do have a tendency to, to, to make a lot of mistakes. But they also take guys who you wouldn't think would ever be stars and make them millionaires too. So you gotta you got to give them credit on that uh, on that front too. But um, it's a crapshoot. You know what I mean? It's You're taking a chance any time you go um, anywhere, really. Exactly. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate your input. And one final, one final note. Do you think the host phone problems? Do you think we could attribute that? Is that George Bush's uh, fault as well? One hundred percent, George Bush. Yeah, yeah. You thanks, guys don't have a George that, Bush. Man. You guys don't have a George Bush up in Canada, but uh, we'll still you know, blame he, George he Bush the for the we phone problem. We have Rob Ford. We have Rob Ford. He gets the, yeah, you guys get the the crack smoking mayor. Yeah, so that's just as bad. Well, awesome, RJ. I really appreciate it. Your promos and every work has been phenomenal. I love it. So keep up the great work. Thanks, Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Thank you, Craig, for calling in. Um, I'm sorry, RJ, that my phone does not live up to the uh, champion's expectations. Um, so you're doing good right, right now. Uh, I, can hear last, you fine. I know you can hear me fine. I'm, it just, that's Craig. He's a local wrestling fan. It's great to have him on the show. Um, let's see here. We've got one more question here. Um, my last question is, because there might be some people listening, there's a lot of people that want to get into this business. There's, there's over 10,000 wrestlers probably wrestling independently around the world, and that's a big number, but many fans probably think, how do I get in this business? And how? what do you do? What's the best advice you can give someone if they want to be a wrestler? Well, I think... Uh, I, the answer, I think, has changed over the past few years. I don't think it's the same answer I would have given when I first started because when I first started, I would have told guys to go to a good wrestling school, learn how to wrestle, pay your dues, um, travel, do shows, um, learn how to talk, work out, look good, um, wrestle good, talk good. And I think that still applies for people who want to do this, but if your main goal is to get into WWE, I think a lot of times – maybe just looking good is all you need and then just, you know, try to send them tapes and they 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 sign so many guys without experience that I can't tell everybody, hey, go to wrestling school, bust your ass and work for peanuts and, and uh, travel everywhere because that's not really the answer anymore. I'm not saying you're not going to get there that way, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the course that's going to get you there. So I think the answer might be different for everybody. If you really, really love this, if you love the wrestling business, then I would say, find a good wrestling school, learn how to work the right way and take pride in your work and get as much experience and exposure as you can. Um, if your goal is to make a ton of money in wrestling and you don't care about the business that much, uh, unfortunately, you probably you probably still could get a job if you look good enough, but um, there's a lot of bullshit you got to put up with and it's not always worth it if you're just in it for the money. So I would tell people to just, again, like I said, just work hard, um, have a good attitude, listen, get as much experience as you can and just travel and see things and wrestle different people, different styles, and make yourself as marketable as you can. That's that's what it's all about is selling tickets. Anyways, RJ, I want to take the time to thank you. On Friday, I will be at the um, local show here in Winnipeg, um, possibly and most likely getting an interview with WWE legend Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Beefcake. Until then, I want to thank you, RJ, for uh, tuning in um, and um, doing this interview with us. I really appreciate it. Hey, my, my pleasure, man. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. That was RJ Brewer. Once again, I apologize for my uh, phone breaking up during the interview. RJ wrestled in WWE. Ring of Honor had a match in TNA as well. Um, this is Jordan Garber, um, Brutus Beefcake. Will he be on Wrestling World 247 and Harlan Wanna Farm Radio? We will find out. Um, this is Jordan Garber for Talent Farm Radio and Wrestling World 247. Follow me on Twitter at JordanZone17. Uh, go on my Facebook, add me at facebook.com backslash jgarber1. Uh, go on to Helena Farm Radio's Blog Talk Radio page at blogtalkradio.com backslash Helena Farm. 
and stay solid. This is Jordan Garber. I'm out.